NASCAR has moved indoor mass mandates. Chase Elliott and Kyle Larson spoke to each other for the Cup Series race out about last week at Auto Club, and it looks like Gray Biffle is going to run some more Cup Series races here this season. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We've got a ton of NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just jump straight into those really, really quickly. Let's first take a look at a quick paint scheme. The paint scheme we're taking a look at is Chris Bush's 2022 It's Savvy scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Phoenix. This paint scheme is all right, in my opinion. I'm not a fan of the black and the, and the orange together. I don't really think that combination works really, really good. It's an okay paint scheme. It's not my favorite so far. Hopefully, we can see a really good, hopefully, it does really, really good, but honestly, I'm not overall the biggest fan of this paint scheme. I understand why it's there, but I'm overall not the biggest fan of this paint scheme, to be perfectly honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Kyle Larson. As Kyle Larson is now the new current points leader in the Cup Series. I believe Kyle Larson is now up by day points. Austin Hendrick had led the points lead for the last two weeks, and now Kyle Larson has taken over the points lead after having a very strong run at Las Vegas while finishing second and not going to victory lane. He has finished second and first the last couple of weeks. I know the Daytona 500 did not go very well for Kyle Larson, but he continues to be really, really strong. And I think Kyle Larson did year does have a very good chance to win the championship in the cup series and now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about cautions now so far in the first three races we have seen 31 cautions this is also reported by joseph Sturgley. this is tied for the most cautions in three races in nascar history the most we've seen was back in 2011 we also saw 31 cautions a lot of us coming from the first race of the year at the daytona 500 also the las vegas race saw a lot of levels but there have been so many cautions here so far in 2022 and i think a lot of that is one of these teams are good continuing to learn how what they can do with these cars and how much they can push the boundaries and also there's a lot of guys not knowing how these cars really really work and I think that's one thing that really is making this year so much fun is the fact that you really don't know who's going to win these races and really don't know what's going to happen so I've over really have overall enjoyed this season and I think it's really great and a lot of cautions but that's something I think that will continue to drop as we get farther into the season. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're unfortunately going to take this episode to a little bit of a sour note. My prayers go out to Todd Parrott. Todd Parrott is currently into the hospital right now, because so I believe he had a cardiac issue or cardiac arrest or something happened to him, unfortunately, and he's currently sitting in the hospital. Now, he is currently improving at this time, but Todd Parrott currently sits in the hospital right now. My prayers go out to Todd Parrott and his family. Hopefully, we'll see him back really, really soon, and I'm wishing for a very speedy recovery for Todd Parrott. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Hendrick Motorsports. As this is a statistic I think that's absolutely crazy. Hendrick Motorsports has won seven of the last eight NASCAR Cup Series races. The last time, the only time in the last eight races that they've not won a Cup Series race was the Daytona 500 won by Austin Center. And another crazy fact, the last time a driver over, over the age of 31 years old won a NASCAR Cup Series race, we have to go all the way back to, La I believe, Las Vegas when Denny Hamlin won. And of all those Hendrick wins, the only two drivers of one of the Hendrick Motorsports have been Alex Bowman and Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson, of course, scoring five of those victories, and Alex Bowman scoring two of those victories. Now, have we not had that late race restart? Do you think they win? Probably not, to be real with you. But I think it's absolutely crazy to see that Hendrick Motorsports has won seven out of the last eight races. And another fact... They're only 18 wins away from getting to 300. They would right now likely be the first team to reach 300 victories. So, Hendrick Motorsports looking really, really strong. And again, they're, it's cool to see that they continue to show a lot of peace being promised art this year. It's great to see that. And I'm very happy to see that that is going on for Hendrick Motorsports. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Chad Fincham. As was announced on Saturday that Chad Fincham is going to drive the 13th for NBA Motorsports at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Now this car is going to have to qualify due to the fact it does not have a ton of owner's points, but I think Chad Fincham is a pretty decent driver. Now, of course, these cars are not really fast. So like I said, they're going to have a really tough time getting into the race unless they can find an engine release from another organization like a Joe Gibbs Racing or something. They're going to have to qualify their way into the race. Now, I think Chad, like I said, I think Chad Finch is a pretty good driver. I think the goal is for them to make the field. There are a lot of cars probably going to be tempting to race at Atlanta because they're going to get to like a super speedway. We're probably going to see higher entries for a race like Atlanta than other types of races. Overall, really cool to see, and I'm glad to see a Chad Finch is back behind a wheel. I hope he does really, really great, and I'm glad to see that he's back behind a wheel. Good luck to him, and hopefully he will do very, very good here. 
And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about IndyCar aero screens. Now, Will Buxton was at the season opener for St. Petersburg, and he says that he spoke to a ton of drivers about the IndyCar aero screens. And he said to Eli had a ton of drivers to talk to and said they're not a big fan of the aero screens. Now, when Will Buxton reported that, a ton of IndyCar drivers really started coming at him. Jimmy Johnson was one of them that basically said, if it wasn't for the aero screen, I wouldn't be here. Graham Rahal says something about it. Marcus Erickson called them out. I think Joseph Newgarden called them out as well. There were a ton of drivers that responded to this and were like, what are you talking about? And I have to agree with a lot of people. Now, I will say that David Lane did report later, another fellow YouTuber, did report that he did say that basically he and Vashel one driver said that he wasn't a big fan of the aero screen. A couple drivers said they were also weren't basically overall they wished it would change. But overall, the majority of drivers said that they did not want it to change. And that's what I'm saying when it comes to reporting and stuff. Be a little bit more specific when it comes to this stuff. That being said, though, I think the aero screen is something that is very, very important for IndyCar. And I don't think that's a big reason why they're changing the hybrid components. But I think it's very important to note that, again, Will Buxton works in F1. I know he's trying to get an IndyCar, and I appreciate what he's trying to do there. But at the same time, if you really don't know what you're talking about, don't really say something in that situation. So in my opinion, I understand what Will Bux is trying to do here. I get it. But at the same time, he really is wrong in this situation, to be honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Spencer Boyd. Now... If you watched an NASCAR Camp Road Truck Series race, on the last run of the race, Spencer Boyd got into a very hard wreck. Now, they really never showed a replay until you had to go on Twitter like a day later to see the replay. But Spencer Boyd crashed really, really hard in the NASCAR Camp and World Truck Series and unfortunately dislocated his arm and shoulder in the last lap crash that he was involved in. Now, he was evaluated and released from the care center, and he did have a little bit of damage. He said he's hopeful that he'll be able to race in Atlanta. He did have to go to a hospital and in Charlotte, and he will basically go back for some more tests and stuff, but he is expected to be releasing this next week at Atlanta. Very tough to see what happened to Spencer Boyd. That was a really hard wreck. I saw the wreck too in the replay. I'm like, oh my goodness. That was a really hard wreck. I'm surprised that Fox really never caught that. It's one thing about the truck series race. We'll talk about some of the broadcasting. We'll get to that in a little bit, but I will say that I'm glad that Spencer Boyd is overall okay, and I'm happy to see that Spencer Boyd is going to be back behind the wheel really, really soon when we go to Atlanta here in a couple weeks. We've got two weeks to Atlanta Motor Speedway, which is going to be the first test with the new Atlanta configuration. So I'm excited for that, and I'm happy to see Spencer Boyd at least is okay. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Zane Smith. As Zane Smith, he actually came across line second in the NASA Camp World Truck Series. But unfortunately for Zane Smith, he was disqualified for a lug nut issue. Now, a lot of people thought it was a loose lug nut situation. It wasn't a loose lug nut situation. Apparently, they have like affected the lug nuts on the trucks, and that's what really caused them to get a disqualification. Now, I think they had all their lug nuts in the cars, but they found something wrong with the lug nuts. That's really unfortunate for Zane Smith because Zane Smith was going to come home basically leading the poor, really probably leading the point standings, and he drops only, I think, outside the top 10 now in points because of that. Now, he did lose a race, and at least he didn't win. And he this call and we've gotten to win to Chandler Smith but it's definitely unfortunate what happened to Zane Smith Jerry Freeze who basically runs the organization from Road Motorsports he did say that they're not they're unsure if they're going to appeal the penalty for Zane Smith again from Road Motorsports is a lot of penalties they're going to have to appeal because they're already appealing the one for Todd Gillen it's unclear when we're going to see that penalty we're going to hear more about that but Zane Smith definitely it's unfortunate what happened for Zane Smith but again you got to follow the rules and stuff but at the same time sometimes the rules and penalties can be a little bit excessive overall though NASCAR made a good call here. It's unfortunate what happened, but in my opinion, it is what it is in that situation. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Joe Graff Jr. As in the NASCAR Xfinity Series race, Joe Graff Jr. has been also disqualified from the Xfinity Series race at Las Vegas. Now, if he had not been disqualified, he would not really have finished up front, but he finished 29th. And the reason is, is because of three loose law nets. Now, Here's my overall opinion on the loose slut penalty. I do not believe that you should be disqualified for having loose slut nuts on your car. And this is one reason why I'm so happy now that we only have one lug nut on the Cup Series cars compared to the Xfinity and Truck Series with five lug nuts because now you really don't have any issues because if you lose a lug nut, your tire is going off and you're getting a four-race suspension for your crew chief 
and your crew members as well. Overall, though, in my opinion, I think that Joe Graff Jr. should not have been disqualified. Yes, he wouldn't have finished up front. And Joe Graff Jr. was kind of a weapon this week and compared to Sinceri, that car basically won the last week with Cole Custer. Yes, it was an SHR, a really good SHR prepared car. But Joe Graff Jr. finished 29th and also disqual got disqualified for the race. But overall, it is what it is in this situation. I'm, they're probably going to maybe try to appeal, but honestly, I'm not sure if they're going to be able to appeal and they be able to win, to be honest with you. And now we're going into on to the next story of today's episode. As we're talking about the Fox Xfinity Series broadcast. Now, next week on the Xfinity Series broadcast, well, this week technically, for the Xfinity Series broadcast, the people that will be broadcasting the event, Joey Logano is going back for third straight week in a row. Joey Logano has uh, commentated the Xfinity Series race at Auto Club in Las Vegas. And Daniel Suarez is going to be joining the booth this weekend at Phoenix International Raceway. I will say that the Xfinity Series broadcasts have actually generally been really, really good. And I, I know a lot of people are not a big fan of Joey Logano when it comes to his racecraft on the racetrack. But Joey Logano has done a really, really good job as a commentator and has done a really solid job. And Daniel Suarez, I've heard him a couple times do commentary. And overall... He's done a really solid and pretty good job. So I'm excited to see these guys are going to be back in the booth and glad to see Logano's back in the booth. And I think Dick Finney has done a really good job. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about the Fox Premier Show and the coverage in general. This is something that I've been wanting to say for a very, very long time. But the pre-race show yesterday, oh my God, it was absolutely horrendous. Now, I'm not talking about the FS1 portion because the FS1 portion, they did a really solid job. And if it was that was with the pre-race show, I would have been okay with that. But oh my goodness, the pre-race show for the Fox broadcast was super bad and super cringy. Let's start off with that horrendous skip for Chase Elliott and Kyle Larson. Bob Pocker literally reports an hour earlier, and we'll get into that in a little bit, that Chase Elliott and Kyle Larson are really on, on good terms. And they make a skit about the situation. I don't know if they're trying to reference a movie, but it was so cringy. My jaw was on the freaking floor. Well, not really literally on the floor, but my jaw was literally open. I was not, I was like, what are they doing here? Then they had that magic thing where Michael Walter went into like that, that fortune teller thing. And I was like, what are they doing here? Then he had a cringy ass, put it out, where basically had a guy running from, which of cops and stuff, which that doesn't really even matter to the race. Do if you're gonna do it, put it out, at least you'll do it for the race. Don't do it for that. I mean, it was a little funny, but honestly, be focused on the racing topic. And then they had all the other stuff. The grid walk was cringy too. This is one thing. I'm gonna say this: the coverage of the cop race, when we had the racing on, was really, really good. But the pre-race, man, was so bad. Fox needs to take this coverage really much more seriously. They really need to take this coverage a lot more seriously because people are just going to turn off this coverage. They're not going to watch it. I know a lot of people probably are not going to watch pre-race anymore. I'm probably honestly may not watch pre-race anymore because of how bad it was. It was the worst pre-race show I have ever seen, at least on the Fox broadcast. It was the worst pre-race show I've ever seen. And honestly, the Daytona 500 was one was pretty good, in my opinion. They did a good job on that one. But they have done a terrible job with these pre-races in the past. And that's one thing that absolutely needs to change is the pre-race was absolutely horrendous and absolutely godsmackingly awful. I understand they're trying to put on a show, but they've got to do a better job when it comes to the pre-race show. Because in my opinion, they did an horrendous job when it came to the pre-race show. I understand the frustrate. I understand why a lot of people are upset about it now because the pre-race was absolutely horrendous. It was absolutely terrible, and I did not enjoy the pre-race, to be honest with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Christian Eckes versus Kyle Busch. Now, if you watch an Astro Camp World Truck Series, Kyle Busch was in the Truck Series race. And there was a late battle on one of the late restarts. There was a lot of cautions in the Nassau camp and World Truck Series. And they were battling overall for the victory around seven to six laps to go. Kyle Busch was on the inside of Christian Eggers, and Christian Eggers is on the outside. And Christian Eggers literally comes down on Kyle Busch and wrecks himself and gets into the inside wall. Now, initially, I thought Kyle Busch had caused that wreck. But when I took a look at that replay and saw, I'm like, okay, that was not, that was not Kyle Busch at all. Christian Eggers wrecks himself. Christian Eckes goes on and kind of blames Kyle Busch for basically wrecking him and said, I basically came down and tried to put on a really, really bad block. That literally is one of the worst block jobs I've ever seen in my entire life as a NASCAR fan. And Christian Eckes, I understand you're frustrated because you are on the verge of getting your second straight Las Vegas victory and you didn't want to be beat by Kyle Busch. But let's be honest, dude, you wrecked yourself. 
You literally came down on Kyle. He literally was there. It was a terrible block. And Kyle Bush, you can't blame Kyle Bush for that. You took yourself out of the race and wrecked yourself. I understand you're frustrated and pissed off at the fact that you were contending for a chance to win and you got wrecked. But that was your fault, dude. You took yourself out of contention in that wreck. So in my opinion, that is overall your fault in that situation. And in my opinion, Christian Egg is at fault. And Christian Egg is really, in my opinion, does not have a right to be upset with Kim right there. That's my opinion, though, on that situation. And I understand he's frustrated, but at the same time, that was on Christian Egg. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode, as we're talking about another little rivalry that kind of started yesterday, Kyle Busch versus Chase Briscoe. Now, Kyle Busch ended up finishing really well in the Cup Series race. We have got some more stuff to talk about when it comes to Kyle Busch. But Kyle Busch was very have not happy with Chase Briscoe, I think, at the conclusion of stage number one. Because on the late race, late restart for stage number one, Kyle Busch was about to pass Chase Briscoe on the outside, and Kyle Busch got blocked by Chase Briscoe. After this, they started battling really, really hard. At the end of stage number one, they were battling for a really good position. And Kyle Busch, after this race, ran up to, to Chase Briscoe and showed his displeasure. I really do not know here why Kyle Busch was mad. I look back at the replays and stuff, and Kyle Busch really had no reason to be upset. I understand he doesn't like getting blocked, and sometimes it's frustrating when he do get blocked. But at the same time, man, he's racing for a position that's up front and contending for a really good position. You can't really be mad at Chase Briscoe for racing really hard and doing the best he can out there. Because that's what he's trying to do is put on a good show and race the best he can and trying to get another really, really good run. So I understand Kyle Busch's frustration, but at the same time, he really in this situation does not have a right to be upset with Chase Briscoe right there. Again, I understand his frustration, believe me, but at the same time, he really does not have a great reason to be frustrated, to be real with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Joey Logano. Now, Joey Logano was being interviewed by the media yeah, on Saturday, and he says the number one thing that everyone has to work on with the next-gen car is the flat tire situation. He doesn't think it'll be an easy situation, but it's hopeful there'll be one. Now, if you've been following throughout the beginning of this season so far, there has been a lot of issues when it comes to the flat tires, especially at Auto Club and Daytona. If At Auto Club, we notice this a lot too. If your car basically had multiple flat tires, you would get beached and you would lose a ton of laps. Now, NASCAR has been trying to find a solution in regards to this. They've been trying to find a solution to see if there's something they can do about this flat tire situation. But unfortunately, they have not been able to find a really good solution in regards to this. Now, noticeably at Las Vegas, we noticed this too. There were not many drivers that really had flat tire problems. And pretty much there was only, I think, one or two. I don't think anyone had to get up on the tow truck. Now, we saw a couple guys get multiple flat tires, but they were able to drive it back to the pits in majority. And I think this is one thing the drivers are going to have to learn. NASCAR's because I think, let's be honest with ourselves, NASCAR, I don't think, needs to really change anything here because the racing's been really, really good or don't really need to change anything too much because the racing we've seen has absolutely been killer and absolutely been really, really fun to watch as a race fan for myself. But the flat tire situation, there definitely has to be something fixed. But like I said at Vegas, I think one thing Kyle Busch said is that it's, a, it's not a flat tire problem. It's a spinning problem. These guys are getting really, really loose into corners and they're overdriving. And that's what unfortunately is causing a lot of these strikes. And unfortunately, a lot of guys are getting flat tires right here. Now, I will say the flat tire situation will have to be resolved long term. But at the same time, I understand where Kyle and Joey are coming from. They do have to figure out a solution long term for these flat tires. But right now, I don't know what they can do in this situation in regards to flat tires. So I'm not sure what they're going to do. But the flat tire situation hopefully will get resolved in the future. But I'm not sure what they can do. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Kyle Busch. Now, Kyle Busch was being interviewed by the media on Saturday, and he says he's happy with the pro progression of Chandler Smith and direction of the 18 team, but says that they need to get the John Hunter Nemechek's team turned around and headed back in the right direction as he is currently watching performance. If you look at the performance between the 18 and the four car, especially since the end of last year, both of these guys have really swapped in performance. If you watch the beginning of 2021, John Hernemacek was winning a ton of races and was performing at a really high level. But as the year progressed, he started losing a lot of that really high speed. The that's not saying John Hernemacek is absolutely sucky because he ran really well at Vegas and was up front and contending for the win and was up front at Daytona and contending for that win as well. But Kyle Busch is wanting to see if this 14 can really step it up to the plate. I think John Hernemichek is a very talented and a really great driver, but the 14 does have some things that they do need to work on. That being said, though, Kyle Busch is probably watching a little bit too early in regards to that performance. I think it's a little too early to kind of be looking at the performance of them, considering the fact 
that this team is still, I think the four team is going to be a team that's going to contend for a championship here this year. And once again, we'll be up front throughout the season. Overall, though, I understand what Kyle Busch is trying to do here. But at the same time, I do think in all seriousness and seriously, I do believe that it's a little too early to be kind of looking at where the four team is. They do have some work to do. Don't get me wrong, but they were up front and they only got taken out because Derek Krause got a little bit crazy and a little bit overall crazy. But overall, I think that this team will figure it out. I think John Michek will be contending for wins. He qualified on the pole and just a car wasn't as good as the race went on. But I do think as the year progresses, we're going to see a much better team in that number uh, four truck, to be honest with you. And now we're going into the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Kurt Busch. Now, John Haverlin reported on this. He was actually at the racetrack, and he says at the racetrack, he was actually at the racetrack, I heard Kurt Busch say this. He says that Kurt Busch might be making some Xfinity Series starts in the 2022 season. There's two races that he mentioned, Surrogate America's and the Talladega Spring Race. Now, there are a couple things to note about the Talladega Spring Race and why Kurt Busch would not be able to run that event. The reason is, is because it is a dash for cash races. And Cup Series drivers that are running for the championship are not allowed to race in the event. Now, unless Kurt Busch decides to switch points, which he's not going to do that because he's competing for a NASCAR Cup Series championship and is trying to get into the playoffs. I think he's around the playoff cutoff line right now, around that area. And he's trying to currently get into the playoffs and make it to the playoffs. He doesn't want to have a complete reset and be really, really far behind. But I want to say this. This is so awesome, though. If this is true and Kurt Busch is racing at Coda, it's so awesome. I don't remember. The, I think the last time Kurt raced in Xfinity was like 2013 or 2014. It's been quite a few years since Kurt Busch has raced in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. I think the last time was maybe like Talladega or Daytona in 2013 when he drove the one car for Phoenix racing that year. And honestly, having Kurt Busch back in Xfinity, I think it's going to be really, really fun. Another big question is what team, if he does, is true that he's going to run, what team is Kurt Busch going to run for? Well, there's only two teams that really come to mind. The first team is the 26 for Sam Hunt Racing. Sam Hunt Racing has a major ties with Toyota Racing Development, and this team has shown a lot of pace and a lot of speed. And I think Kurt Busch can come in there and get the best out of that equipment. John Remichek, yes, he did spin out, but he bounced back to a 12th place finish, and we're going to see him more race. We'll talk about where he will be racing later. But Kurt Busch, I think the other team that Kurt Busch could run for is the 18 car for Joe Gibbs Racing. I do believe that the Circuit America's race for that 18 team is available, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think Trevor Bain's got any race with that team yet. I don't think Ryan Truex is racing for them at Cutta. And we know Drew Dollar's only running the Super Speed races. So Kurt Busch would definitely be a really good choice for that race because I think it really was a mess where that 18 team is. And I think Kurt Busch, if he gets in the 18 car, I think he can win. And like I said, I think if Kurt Busch gets into one of these cars, I think he absolutely can win. Kurt Busch is a very talented and a really awesome driver. So I really hope Kurt Busch can get into one of the get into the ride. I hope it's true that he races because I think if it is true and he gets to race this year, I think it'll be very, very awesome and very, very fun. So I hope Kurt, this is true, and I hope that we get to see Kurt Busch race here in the 2022 season in Xfinity for the first time in nine years. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about John Hunter Nemechek. As John Nemechek was announced on Friday that he will drive the 26 for Sam Hunt Racing this weekend at Phoenix. John Nemechek is already scheduled to run two races. He already ran at Las Vegas yes, a couple days ago and also will be running at Las Vegas later this year. But he's getting another start at Phoenix in the 26 car. John Nemechek is coming off a 12th place finish in the Xfinity Series race, but he was running in the top 10 a majority of that race and had that spin not happen in that late race caution happened for Jesse Wuji. I do believe that John Hunter Nemechek would have contended for a potential top five or a top 10. It would have done really, really well with the Sam Hunt Racing Group. If he doesn't have any problems, I think John Hunter Nemechek will be a contender for a really strong run. I don't think he's going to win because I don't think Sam Hunt Racing right now has those capabilities to go out there and win. But I think that John Hunter, John Hunter Nemechek is going to have a very strong and a really, really good run this year. So I'm really excited to see if John Hunter's getting back behind a wheel in that 26 team. I think, like I said, I think that John Hunter is going to do really, really well this weekend. Now, what are my expectations for the weekend? I think John Hunter will potentially get a top 10 this weekend or even a top five. Like I said, I don't expect John Hunter to get into the car and win this year. But 
I think John Hunter will do very, very good. I think he'll do really, really awesome. And I think that we're going to see him do really, really good this weekend with the top 10 finish with Sam Hunt Racing. Get them in a good position. The owner's points to get farther into the year. I'm not sure other than Vegas later this year in Phoenix, he's going to run more races with the team. But it's good to see that he's going to run some Xfinity Series races. And I would not be surprised if he does get into that 18 car for Joe Gibbs Racing at some point this year. Overall, though, really awesome to see that. And I'm happy to see that we're going to see John Henry Michek in the 26 for Sam on Racing once again. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Kyle Busch and Alex Bowman. Now, if you watched the NASCAR Cup Series race yesterday, there was a caution that came out with two laps to go in this race or three laps going in this race for the matter, for Eric Jones. Kyle Busch was on the verge of cruising to a victory earlier yesterday. And then Eric Jones, like I said, gets into the outside wall. NASCAR takes a long time to throw the caution, and Bubba Wallace also gets collected in that ruck. Bubba really had nowhere to go. I saw a lot of people criticizing Bubba for the ruck when Bubba really had nowhere to go. It really wasn't Bubba's fault. Well, he gets to the restart, and Kyle Busch decides to take four tires on the restart and ends up losing the race, and Alex Bowman goes to victory. And Kyle Busch on the radio, while his interview on TV was really, really good, Kyle Busch had some very, very funny comments that he said at the race. He says, the same effing guy who backs in every effing win that he ever effing gets back into, backs into another effing win. Bullshit. Oh my goodness, the old Kyle Busch, that, and, uh, the Kyle Busch that I love to see. I love when drivers are upset and tempers are showing up in these races. And to be fair to Kyle Busch and to be fair to Alex Bowman, and to be a couple things here, Alex Bowman does get a lot of lucky wins. But I'm going to be real with this one compared to other races. This is not a lucky win. This was a straight-up earned win for Alex Bowman. Because not only did he have to take a really good strategy call, because Kyle Busch probably should have taken four tires. If they take four tires, two tires, they're going to win the race. Because, they, again, these guys try to strategize it up to try to basically change it up so they can make play strategy. And these teams, like the 300 cars, played the strategy right, and they got better finishes than they were all going to get. Bowman was probably going to finish third or fourth. Larson was probably going to finish sixth. And William Byron was probably going to finish around fourth or fifth in the race. So around where they probably were going to finish with some of them, but some of them finished better than others. But Alex Bowman had to also hold off a hard-charging Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson was faster than Bowman on, was actually the winner on pit road. And Bowman just got a better push by Kyle Busch and got a better restart. And to be fair, Kyle Busch probably should have chosen the high lane. I get Kyle Busch's frustration, though. I mean, Kyle Busch was really this close to winning yesterday. And unfortunately, he unfortunately lost an opportunity to win that, which, again, is really, really sucky for Kyle Busch. Again, I understand Kyle Busch's frustration, believe me. But at the same time, man, I think it's really funny. He's calling out, basically said, the lucky one. He's really now the new closer. And I understand his frustration, but at the same time, I think it's really funny to see that Kyle Busch is getting really, really mad at what's going on, how Alex Bowman won that race yesterday. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ryan Sieg versus Ty Gibbs. Now, if you watch the NASCAR Xfinity Series race, Ty Gibbs actually picked up his first win of the 2022 season, but would not be without controversy. Before the green flag dropped, Ty Gibbs would have to drop to the rear of the field. Now, he really didn't have to drop too far to the rear because basically he started 23rd because so many cars in that race had to drop to the rear of the field. I think 16 out of the 38 cars that made the race had to go to the rear of the field. A lot of them for adjustments, a lot of them for backup cars because remember, it was a doubleheader weekend. And on lap four of the race, Ty Gibbs was already up to 12 or 13 with probably the fastest car in this race and we saw them have some contact on lap four of this race ty gibbs just had very slight contact was a little bit too aggressive and was really impatient in the race and ryan c got a ton of damage because that and on the radio he was very very pissed and not very happy and then when we had the rain delay or the snow delay if you look because it snowed at las vegas we saw those two get confronted and confront each other and they were not very happy with each other Ryan C basically said it's not over and basically said he knows what he's doing. He's got the best car. And he said he knows what he's doing. It's just what he did was not very smart. Then Jamie, I think it was Jamie Little interviewed, said, is this over? He said, no, I don't think it's over. And then we get back on track and a few laps into the restart, Ryan C is so slow. NASCAR actually black flags him. And then Ryan C basically comes up and tries to retaliate and wreck Ty Gibbs and ends up having the worst retaliation move I've ever seen in the history. Probably almost worse than Danica's retaliation in 2012 as Landon Castle once said, the number one soccer, soccer racing is learn to wreck somebody without wrecking yourself. And not only did he end up wrecking himself, he ended up getting Brett Moffitt in 
child and create a ton of damage for you guys that really were not involved in the incident and were really not involved in the doing. They got involved with something that was really out of their control. And I understand if they were really pissed off at Ryan Sieg. Look, if you're going to pay somebody back, do it at another track like a short track. Don't do it here at Las Vegas at high speed track. Just you don't pay somebody back here at a high speed track like that. I get he's not upset and frustrated, but man, you don't retaliate there. At the same time, though, I understand where Ryan Seek's coming from. And Ty Gibbs, and that's one thing about Ty Gibbs. Yes, he messed up, but he took responsibility. He said it wasn't intentional. And that's one thing about Ty Gibbs. I think he's a really young, he's a young driver who's very aggressive, who does have a little bit of temper at points, but he's a driver who's also at points very, very mature. And he apologized and took responsibility for the wreck. What really more can you ask a guy? He took responsibility for the crash and said it was my fault and I should not have been that aggressive. And I do apologize to the team. That being said, though, I, I don't really 100% understand why he tried. Basically, it's funny because Ryan Seek tried to intentionally wreck him, and that was really, really funny that he ended up being the one that looked like a clown at the end of the day. But it is what it is overall in that situation, and that's the frustration behind why Ryan Seek was mad at Ty Gibbs. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're now talking about Andretti Global. Now, this was reported this morning by Adam Stern that Michael Andretti says that the investors and sports team owners backing his F1 team are all fully American and that they got involved in part because of a serious growth there. You look at the growth of F1 right now, how many, how much American presence there is. There's talk currently right now of a third Formula One race that's on the verge of happening right now. Now, let's get back to talking about the Andretti F1 team. Andretti Global is a team that is, if, if they do get approved by the FIA, and we're supposed to know that here in the coming days, if they get approved by the FIA to have the team around, they will show up in 2024. They will have a partnership with Renault, and they will have a working partnership also with Alpine as well. And they will be based in England. They'll be building cars, I think, in the United States, but they'll also have a team base in England as well. Other things to note is that if they do get approved, who is going to be the team principal? Because they were trying to get Otmar Suzwan, and I don't remember the guy's name, but they were trying to get Otmar Suzwan, who's now the working guy at Alpine, who, of course, they're also getting a relationship with Alpine, so Otmar will be able to help that team out throughout the years. But the big question around the team, if they do get approved right now, is who are going to be the drivers who end up driving for Androdi Global? Well, one of the drivers is obvious. The first one is going to be Kyle, is going to be Colton Herta. Colin Hurry was actually supposed to go to Formula One this season and was supposed to drive for the Sauber organization because Andrea was supposed to buy into the uh, Alfa Romeo Sauber organization. And they were actually very, very close to buying into that team. But unfortunately, what ended up happening was a deal fell through, and Michael Andretti was not really, really happy about that, and basically said that he kind of felt a little cheated at not having an opportunity to have a car in, in that situation and context. But now it looks like that they're going to be approved, and Colin Herta is also was faster than Kimi Raikkonen and Antonio Giovinazzi in the simulator. Also, I, Colin Herta has been a driver that really was one to go to Formula One at points, and I think they're playing a smart by swaying two years. The other driver that it will most likely be, it will either be Logan Sargent or Kyle Kirkwood. Now, if you're wanting to have a team that's really, really successful from the get-go, I like Logan Sargent. Don't get me wrong. I think Logan is a very talented driver in the ranks, a very talented American driver. But if you're going to want a team that's going to be very successful from the get-go, you need to get Kyle Kirkwood. Kyle Kirkwood has won in every series besides IndyCar at this point. He has won every championship in the road to Indy. And I think he'd be a perfect driver and a really good benchmark for your organization to really see where your team is at. So I think that they're going to have a team that's going to start. I think the easiest decision and no-brainer is to put those two drivers in. We're going to have to wait and see what happens when it comes to approval for the team. But it looks like very likely, I think if they do get approved, it'll be Colin Herta and Kyle Kirkwood. And if it does get, does get approved, we will have an 11 Formula One team, which will be the first time since 2016 that that has happened. So I do hope that they do get approved. I think it'd be really, really awesome. And I hope that they do get approved here before the season. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Nikita Masman. As expected, Nikita Masman and Urkeley have been officially let go of Formula One. Nikita Masman will not be racing Formula One in 2022 due to the situation that's been expected that Nikita Masman was going to be let go due to the fact of him not having the funding and hospice. basically that they could do it without the funding. And the only reason Nikita Masman was in the ride to begin with is because of that funding from Urkeley. But with them dropping the Urkeley sponsorship, it's not a major surprise that they have dropped Nikita Masman from Formula One. Now, the big question currently at the moment is who is going to replace Nikita Mazepin in Formula One? Now, there are a couple drivers that are really being brought up. There's only two drivers currently because Oscar Piestri, he's off the table currently. So there's only two drivers currently that are being considered to replace Nikita Mazepin. The first one is Pietro Fittipaldi. 
Pietro Fittipaldi is a test driver and a reserve driver for Haas F1 right at the moment. And Pietro Fittipaldi does have some starts in Formula 1 for the Haas organization. And I know that his stats at IndyCar were not really impressive. But again, it was a Dale Coyne brick where racing car, which really was not that fast. But again, we've seen Takuma Masada show a lot more speed this year than he would have last year with this organization. So he's the first driver being considered. And technically, yes, he has Brazilian nationality. But Pietro Fittipaldi also technically is an American driver as well. The other driver that's being considered is Antonio Giovinazzi. We've had a lot more reports and indications about Antonio Giovinazzi. Now, there is apparently a buyout clause in Formula E where you can buy a driver of Formula E to come in. Antonio Giovinazzi is currently driving for the Penske Dragon organization in Formula E at this moment for this season. But he could be bought out from Formula E and could take over in race in Formula 1 for Haas. And I think that, honestly, if I had to choose between those two drivers, I would go with Antonio Giovinazzi. Antonio Giovinazzi has a lot of experience, and it would be a really good benchmark to have Antonio be a, a driver to choose from, to work with Antonio. He could be a good benchmark for Mick Schumacher to see if it's just a car or if it's just a driver. I think Mick does have talent, but I think he's being held back by the equipment. But... If you do put Antonio Giovinazzi in the car, you, like I said, you will have a really good benchmark to really see where the organization and the team is currently at. So, in my opinion, if I had to choose between one or the other, I would go with Antonio Giovinazzi. Now, Nikita Maspin being gone, I'm going to be real with y'all. Never should have been a Formula 1 to begin with. He had a lot of issues. He got had, he had those Ranger allegations against him after they went in the car ride. We're not going to get too much into that. He also then got into a fight in a nightclub and also had said some really, really bad things. And he basically felt like that he was felt like he was doesn't understand why he's being fired. But honestly, he should never have been in Formula One in the first place. He never really was a great driver. He never performed very, very well. I understand there's some Nikita Maspin fans that really like him, but he's not a good driver and really not a great person overall either. So and also because his father's an oligarchy, that's another reason why he is being fired from the team. So overall, I understand people that are fans of Nikita, but honestly, I'm not a big fan of Nikita, to be honest with you. I think it's a great decision that they, Haas has made right there. It was expected, but I think Haas right here made it a really, really great decision, to be real with you. And now we're going to jump on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Eric Amarola. Now, Eric Amarola was being interviewed by NASCAR and Fox's Shannon Spake and those people who were in there. And he was asked about Eric's future. And he said on the broadcast, the pre-race show, that he said he's not throwing out the possibility of doing a one-off race or two in the Cup Series after he retires. Now, this is Eric Amarola's final full-time season in the NASCAR Cup Series. And honestly, this year for Eric Amarola has started off on the right foot. He is still the only Cup Series driver that right now has three top 10s. He's the only driver that scored a top 10 in every race, and he's finished no worse than six and has the best average finish of any driver currently in the NASCAR Cup Series at the moment. Now, Eric Amaral, I think, for guys in his last year, I think he's doing really, really good. But I look at the future for Eric Amaral, and I think that maybe he's looking at maybe doing a one-off or two every year, maybe pulling like a David Ray and maybe trying to run the Daytona 500, trying to win NASCAR. He's been some, since somewhat close to win the Daytona 500 over the years. Maybe he's looking at trying to win the Daytona 500. Maybe running like the Bristol Dirt Race at some point. Maybe doing like other races and stuff. Or going out there and doing other races. And I think it'd be awesome if Eric Amaral was at least to continue his career in the NASCAR Cup Series after he does retire. Maybe like on a one-off and stuff. I think it'd be awesome for him to do like a one-off race. And then Eric Amaral is for a guy that's in his last year, he's performing to a really high standard and to a very, very high and a really great level. So Overall, I do hope that Eric Amaral does at least come back and do at least a one-off or two, because I think if he came back and did like a one-off race, I think it'd be very, very awesome. So again, I do, again, I really hope that Eric Amaral does go ahead and does a one-off in the Cup Series in the future. So I'm very excited to see that, and hopefully we will see Eric Amaral do some NASCAR, more, some more Cup Series races after he retires. And now we're going to jump on to the first of three major stories in today's episode as we're going to talk about COVID-19 and NASCAR's indoor mandate policies. Now, it was announced on Friday, and Bob Pock reported this, that NASCAR's indoor mask mandate for media center and suites was pretty much relaxed during the Fontana weekend, and there are no more COVID protocol mandates after, as far as anything dictated by the sanctioning body. This is really, really good news because for the last year or two, we have been basically seeing back and forth how COVID-19 has been in NASCAR, where basically they've had they have masks on and stuff and social distancing and all that stuff, but they are becoming much more relaxed, and I think that's really entitled 
by the whole entire world. If you speak, especially over the last few weeks or so, a lot of COVID mask mandates and all these indoor policies and all this stuff and social distancing and stuff, they are no longer requiring like vaccine cards everywhere. And it seems like throughout this country right now, a lot of the tide is changing. And that has been happening over the last couple of weeks. And it really isn't a major surprise to me with certain things going on right now. It's not a major surprise to me. And the, it feels like NASCAR is back to normal. And you can feel the energy around the sport right now, especially at this moment. The energy around the sport, I think, is absolutely incredible currently at the moment. And them removing these mandates and stuff, too, just gets it back to normal for this sport. Now, there are things an asker could definitely do to make the sport a little bit more normal. Like, I don't know, giving these times every week, like, as much practice as they did. And going back to single round qualifying, very similar to spinning trucks and doing it like that. I'm not a big fan of all the rounds. That's one thing that they can overall change. But... I'm overall extremely happy that NASCAR is removing these COVID-19 mandates, and I'm really happy the sport is starting to slowly but surely progress to getting back to normal. And we're basically, I, like, it's, like I said, I feel so much energy around the sport as a NASCAR fan currently at the moment. And having a chance to see and continuing to see that we're seeing the sport continue to slowly but surely progressively get back to normal, I think is absolutely amazing. And again, I'm very, very happy to see this. They have gone ahead and removed these. I know like outdoors, it isn't a big issue and stuff. And if COVID, we may see it flare up and maybe these mandates will come back in the future. But like I said, the fact that they have gone ahead and just said, you know what, we're going to be done with these and stuff. We're going to move on and start getting back to normal. I think something that this country needs to continue doing and overall i'm very very happy about this yes we should take COVID 19 somewhat seriously don't get me wrong but at the same time this country does need to get back to our moment we've got to live with this virus and we got to live with it and just start moving on so overall very thumbs up in my opinion and very happy to see that they have gone ahead and and removed a lot of the mandate stuff that's a great decision in my honest opinion and now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next major story of today's episode as we're talking about Greg Biffle. Now, Greg Biffle posted on his Instagram story last night after the Cup Series race, basically saying, third or fourth place, we had a fuel pump issue. Bummer. We're going to try again late next next time. And basically indicates that he will be looking to run some more Cup Series races this year, most likely with NY Racing. Now, Greg Biffle so far has ran two NASCAR Cup Series races so far, where unfortunately both times he's had fuel pump problems. He qualified really impressively at Las Vegas 2. He qualified in 26 and was in a really good position to potentially get a top 20. His car was really t all day a top 30 car. Yes, at points he was outside the top 30. The majority of the day, he was inside the top 30, and that's pretty good considering the standards of NY Racing. And of course, he did have that relationship with RCR and that partnership. And they seem like they have shown a lot of pace and speed, especially for a team that's not running the whole entire season. And that's one thing about the next-gen car, too, is the fact that if you're a good driver, you can get the best of out of the equipment, and you can run really, really well. Now, like I said, though, they've had had issues with fuel pumps, but seeing Greg Bivel back behind the wheel, though, in all seriousness, I think is absolutely awesome. And if this team can just figure out their fuel pump issues, this team has potential to do really, really good. Because that's one thing that's unfortunate affecting the team is the fact of the fuel pump problems. Because they've had good speed. I was watching practice at points, and they were in top 20 in practice with NY Racing, nonetheless. They were in the top 20 on speed, top 22, top 23 on speed. Being teams like, you know, some of these smaller teams, they were being like front row motorsports, like Colleg Racing they were beating in practice and stuff. They were showing a lot of pace in practice, and they barely got out qualified by Kevin Harvick. And that just shows how good of a driver Greg Biffle is. Now, overall, like I said, him running some more cup starts this year, how well do I think he'll run? Well, like I said, I need to see this team at least try to finish some of these races. That's one thing that I've really, unfortunately, not been able to see out of Gray Biff on the team is the fact they've not been able to finish races and get to the checker flag when it comes to their major parts problems. But I think if they're able to not have any more problems, I think if this team can finish races and do really well. And again, having Gray Biffle back in the series, of course, he's not going to run all the races because he's got some, he's going to be committed to the SRX, though I will, unless he can qualify the car and stuff and get out. He won't run every single race. And maybe if they isn't Gray Biffle going to run, maybe if they get someone like Matt DiBenedetto perhaps to get a few starts for the team. I know I mentioned Matty D a lot, but maybe Matt DiBenedetto could be a really good option for them to go because he's had a really good run in the Truck Series race where he ended up finishing in the top 10 with the Ragley War Group. There's other drivers they can go with, especially if they're going to try to run the whole season. J.J. Lee would be another good driver that they could go with because they've had J.J. Lee in that car in the past. But overall, like I said with Gray Biffle, having him back in the Cup Series and just seeing him back behind the wheel, it's really, really fun. And not to mention, if you watched that save uh, that Las Vegas this past week, 
Holy crap, that save was abs not only absolutely impressive to watch, but it was absolutely fun to watch, at least, especially for us fans. It was not only impressive, but it was very, very fun to watch. And I do hope that we continue to see the Gray Biffle backpind wheel. And it looks like we're going to see him for more races. It's unclear how many more races we're going to see Gray Biffle backpind wheel. But like I said, having him back in the Cup Series and running Cup Series races is not only fun, but absolutely fun and great. So overall, very happy to see this. It looks like we're going to see Gray Biffle back. I think that's really, really awesome and fun for the fans to be real with you. And now we're going to jump on to the final major story of today's episode as we're going to talk about Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott. Now, we've already talked to Kyle about Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott's situation. If you watched Auto Club Race last week, Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott got into each other and got into a really, really big battle against each other. Where basically, Kyle Larson basically tried a really, really bad block on Chase Elliott, and Chase Elliott got in the outside wall and had damage, and then he basically broke the toe in again, and basically spun out and brought out a caution with nine to go. It seemed like he was maybe trying to intentionally screw Larson, but at the same time, when you look at the steering stuff, I really don't know if he was intentionally wrecked, basically, because it basically broke something in the car, so I'm not really entirely sure if he did intentionally bring that caution out. Well, there is more to the story in regards to the situation. Kyle Larson did say here in, in the media center on Saturday that he says that Rick Kendrick moderated a meeting this week between all four drivers, and they said that the meeting went very, very well with all four of them. They said the meeting was great, and it went really, really well. It doesn't really expect any more issues. Cliff Downs also was on SiriusXM a couple days ago. We talked about as he was on SiriusXM on Thursday, and he says that he is not expecting any more issues between these two. And then Kyle Larson all said that he was going to be talking to Chase Elliott about the situation. Chase Elliott said that the meeting with Hendrick was very, very good. It went very, very well. And he also says that he, he said a kind of re, Kyle kind of reiterated everything that he basically already said and expressed his apology about the whole deal. And he appreciated that. I think Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott do respect each other. I mean, look at how happy Kyle Lars, Chase Elliott was for Kyle Larson. He was happy for Larson when he beat basically when he beat Kevin Harvick at Bristol. Yes, of course, he was really not helping Kyle Larson there. He was really out for himself because, again, to be fair to Chase Elliott, Kyle, well, to be fair to, to him, Chase was out, had every right to be upset with Kevin Harvick in that situation because he got taken out. But I think that one thing you know, these two are teammates, and they're going to have race each other really, really hard. And at points, you're going to have these two confront each other. They're two of the best guys in the business and two of the best race car drivers. I know some people brought up the image of Chase Elliott putting out a post saying he was ahead of Kyle Larson. But let's see, for real, I think that people took that. And again, I think that some of these media personnel need to chill out a little bit now with the situation. And again, I'm very happy to see that Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott have really resolved their differences. And again, these two are teammates. They're going to race each other very, very hard, and they're going to race themselves hard trying to go for a victory. And they're not probably like best of friends, but let's be for real. They're going to race each other really, really hard for time to time. Teammates, especially when these two are not only two of the best current drivers, but two of the best probably in the future going to be two of the best in the history of our sport, and two drivers that are going to carry the sport for the next 10 years. They're going to, of course, butt heads with each other, and they're going to come to differences, and they're going to race against each other. But overall, I do think they do respect each other, and they, again, they will be, able, of course, from time to time, they're going to have differences against each other, and they're going to race each other some, from some points from time to time. They're going to race each other really, really hard and try to go for the win. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to win race stuff and trying to get into the playoffs. And again, Kyle Larson, like I said, did make a really, really bad and overall really over-aggressive block against Chase Elliott. But in my opinion, when it comes to situation, he didn't do it on purpose. And Larson reiterated and apologized him multiple times. He apologized to him in the media center and has multiple times apologized to Chase Elliott for the situation. And these guys have are going to have to race against each other throughout this year. And they race each other. Chase did race Larson. Pretty hard at Las Vegas from time to time. But let's be real. They're just racing really, really hard. They're two of the best guys. Chase Elliott's looking for his first win. Larson almost got a second win. And it, it, in the end of the day, if a Hendrick Motorsports car wins a race, I think that's really should matter against these two. They don't really need to be butting heads against each other. They need to be focusing on trying to win a championship. And they, yes, they, of course, can race against each other. But they do have to work together here to solve the differences and stuff and work together as a team. So I'm overall really, really glad that they've been able to resolve their difference against this, against each other. And I do hope that we don't see any more issues between these two. So again, these are two guys that are not only going to be two of the guys in the future, but are two guys that are going to be carrying the sport for many, many years to come. So overall, I'm very happy to see their situation has been resolved, and I'm glad to see they were able to resolve these problems. So anyway, there's today's long NASCAR motorsports video. I want to thank guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel, Trophy Sean Spino Fight, when a video does go live on my channel. 
Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as for my page. So I'll list schedule below over that and comment about your thoughts on today's video. What are your thoughts about the Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott situation? Do you think now it's official resolve between the two? Let me know in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about Gray Biffle making some more Cup Series starts? Let me know in the comments below. I do have an entry list video that's most likely going to be dropping on the channel tomorrow morning. You should definitely check that out. There will be the entry list for Phoenix. Unclear how many cars are going to show up for that. And I've also got some other videos that are on the way as well that will be coming out here in the next couple of months that I think you'll be able to really enjoy and will really, really like. So anyway, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's video, and I'll see you guys next time for some more awesome NASCAR and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.